Amen. Number 359, bottom of the page here. And we'll, we'll get our Sunday school going today. What a joy to be able to come to church. It's a blessing. Amen. Let's see. Amen. On the first verse. Ready? Sing it out. Sing now. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting heart. Leaning. Safe and secure from all along. Leaning, save me. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Good. On the second, number two. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path. Rose from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, say, leaning, safe and secure from all along. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. On the third, what? have I to dread? What have I to fear? Lead me on the everlasting arm. I have blessed me with my Lord so dear. Lead me on the everlasting. Everybody, lead me. Say, me. Safe and secure from all alarm. Lead me. Lead me. Leaning on the everlasting arm. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Sure is good to see everybody in church today. We've got a lot of folks still coming in outside. It's just a, a blessing. And I hope that you'll, them words like that ought to mean something to you. Uh, safe and secure from all alarm. Uh, we're leaning on the everlasting arm. It's a joy to see you here in church today. Um, obviously, we've never seen a Sunday like this. And uh, we'll talk a lot about it today, but it's a joy to be here. Uh, honest, Vicky had a good crowd on her bus. We're actually considering everything's going on. Uh, the, the kids are just in here happy and having a great time, and I'm glad that you are too. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and get right into our lesson for today. Um, want to be? I got a text from Miss Gail a while ago. She's having a terrible time. She's having to have a CT scan. Got a, uh, in her spine, in her neck. And uh, want us to pray for her this morning. Uh, the Lord will touch her. And then um, so, so a lot of kids, you know, as always, uh, been been sick. Want to pray for them. Pray for those that have to work, travel, so forth and so on. And uh, a lot of people that need prayer this morning. And we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, talk about the, the issue and things going on in our country. Uh, of obviously this morning and in a little bit, but we're going to get right into our Sunday school lesson now. Um, I hope that everybody's had a good week. We had a tremendous prayer meeting here last night. The men met. Lordy mercy, we had a time. The Lord met with us and had good food, good fellowship, and God's still on his throne. He ain't going nowhere. He ain't going nowhere. Amen. So let's pray this morning, and if you got something on your heart, you'd like to let me know. I'm going to lift your hand. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Bless their hearts. Let's pray for them. Let's pray for them as in that wreck. Lord. Amen. All right. Everybody, let's bow our head and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for your many, many, many blessings on our life. We pray in Jesus' name that you'd forgive us of all of our sins. Everything we've said, everything we've done, Lord, every place we've went or have not went or should, didn't say or didn't do that we should have. 
We pray forgiveness right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your protection. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, for mercy, and for goodness and kindness. I do pray for these people in this awful car accident that you'd bless them and help them. I, I pray this morning, Lord, that you'd bless our leaders, our, our president, those that are in authority, that they'd make the right decisions during this time. I pray for all the churches everywhere that we stand for you and love you and serve you and do our job and our part to worship you and honor you in spirit and in truth. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of, of uh, being able to pray. God, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you don't just hear us on Sunday, but you hear us every day of the week. I pray for people who are in the hospital. I pray for Miss Gail. I pray for Corey. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, touch her, her, Lord, and uh, Brother Joey, who's even here with us this morning. I pray that you bless him, continue to touch his, his life and his body. I pray, God, that you'd uh, meet with us in a mighty power today. Bless this service, save lost souls, change lives. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would help all the countries in the world that's uh, being shook by this uh, virus that's going around, Lord. I pray that you'd bring revival, save souls, change lives, do what ought to be done. Help us, Lord, today. Lord, God, meet with us in power. Lord, help us to lean on those everlasting arms. And we'll thank you for what you do. And we love you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right. Come on, Brother Derek. Get our lesson started today. I guess everybody get our Bibles out now. We'll study a little bit here this morning and get right into uh, the Word of God. That's what Sunday school is. Let's pray. All right. Well, uh, good to see y'all out this morning. And um, crowd's a little bit off, but maybe we'll have some more coming in. And what I want to do this morning uh, is not what I had planned. Um, actually, I just kind of threw this together last night uh, or had some ideas last night and actually put it together this morning just because of everything that has happened this week. Um, I had actually been looking at some other topics to do in Sunday school, but uh, I'm going to hold off on that for the time being. I feel like I'm echoing here a little bit. Um, what well, my lesson this morning, uh, hopefully we can have some good class participation. I, I look forward to some comments and insights, uh, but, uh, really what I've done is just written down a bunch of scripture this morning and we're going to look them all up and talk, just talk about them. Um, and that's really, you can see my notes. That's all it is really is just scripture written down. Not, not, don't have a point, don't have outlines or anything, just scriptures. So first one I want to look at this morning um, I mentioned this one last night in the men's prayer meeting. I just want to say that was one of the best men's prayer meetings I believe we've ever had, um, at least for me. It, it, I felt like uh, I got some business done with the Lord last night that needed to be, and um, it, it was a blessing. And if you're a man and you missed it, you you did miss it. But uh, uh, I think part of it is because a lot of people had a greater sense of urgency last night to get a hold of God. And when we uh, when we treat our relationship with the Lord like it's secondary, that's about how far it's going to go. But when we realize that the Lord's the most important thing we've got uh, and how much we need him and how minute we are in, in this universe, then uh, that's when you'll get something from the Lord's when you realize how much you need him. And um, so I, I believe that uh, that was part of it last night. But I shared this verse of scripture last night, uh, and I'm going to share it again this morning. We're going to share a lot more. Uh, what I want to talk about this morning, I know our pastor is going to cover this, I'm sure, from a uh, a different angle than what I'm going to. I'm just going to talk about how a Christian should react during a time of crisis. What our what our uh, reactions should be. You need to, Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, what our reactions should be. So, um, and like I say, I when I say class participation, I, we're not going to debate anything. We're not going to get political. We're just, you know, uh, maybe how these scriptures have helped you during times past, or maybe. Uh, how you haven't thought of this scripture. Maybe you say, yeah, that's a good one. I needed to hear that right now, whatever. But um, whatever the case may be. But I just want to talk about how Christians should react during time of crisis. I think we can all agree that our country right now is in a crisis. Uh, look, can I just, let me go ahead and throw something out here. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of good advice now. Don't let Facebook be your main source of news. I mean, I don't know why I would have to say that, but I think some people, well, I, I, preacher, I read this on Facebook. You can read a lot of stuff on Facebook, okay? Let me tell you what I've read on Facebook over the past week. This ain't nothing. It's all blown out of proportion or it's going to kill us all. No, both of them ain't right. And my, I suspect it might be somewhere kind of in the middle of both of those extremes. Um, I've read this week that um, 
well, why are nurses and doctors, why are they not worried? Then I talked to a lady in the grocery store whose mom's a nurse. She said, my mom's very worried. So, you know, uh, just don't believe everything you read. All right. Uh, I saw an article posted. Uh, somebody had shared it and they said this was written by a doctor. Let me tell you something. If the doctor wrote that article as poorly as it was worded in the terrible English grammar, they ought to pull his license today. That wasn't written by a doctor. That was written by somebody who hadn't even been through sixth grade yet. Okay. So just don't don't fall for all this stuff. Because let me be honest with you, I, I did not know what I did not know how many medical experts I had on my Facebook friends list for this week. I didn't know y'all knew so much. I, I am impressed with the vast amount of knowledge of the in the medical field that some of y'all possess. And I'm, I'm honestly I, I'm I feel humbled by it. But uh let's just look at what the Bible says this morning, okay? Uh, whatever the crisis is, this is how we ought to react, all right. Um, our first passage of scripture is Psalms chapter 46. All right. Um, Psalms chapter 46, I want to read this uh, this morning. And this, I believe, is a good one for Christians to think about. Um, I hear pages turning, so I'll give you time to find that. Uh, Psalm chapter 46. And uh, I want to read verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Aren't you glad that when there's trouble, the Lord's there? Amen. See, that ought to put our minds and our hearts at ease right there. When there's trouble, the Lord is a very present help. He's there with us, and he knows what the answer is. Amen? Right. I was looking at, look at this next verse. Therefore will not we fear. We're not, and listen, as children of God, we're not supposed to let fear get a grip on us. Let me, let me ask you something. If you're saved... And I'm not saying, look, we all know it's going to die. I understand that. But if you're saved, what's the worst thing can happen to you? You go, you go to heaven. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we ought to try to hurry that process along. But here's what I'm saying, folks. We're, if you're saved, you're secure, and you've got a home in heaven no matter what happens. If somebody walks in here with a gun and gets us before the virus does, we're going to heaven to be with the Lord. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. That's the best thing that can happen to you. I probably shouldn't say the worst. That's the best thing that can happen to you. Okay? But notice it says, Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed. Well, the earth ain't been removed yet. The earth's still here. The earth's still spinning. Okay? Uh, so... If we don't have to fear, in the, if the earth is removed, I'm not going to live my life in fear over some virus. Amen? Amen? Now, I'm going to be smart. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to act stupid and, and try to see if I can catch it, see if I can dare it. I'm not going to do that. But folks, come on. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. And I know that ain't happening. I saw Grandfather Mountain this morning on the way over here. It's still there. It's not. It hasn't been moved into the ocean yet. So if we don't have to fear when that happens, why do we live our lives in fear right now? Amen. Because people are telling us to, because uh, but maybe, you know, look, I don't think there's any question the media will try to use this. I'm not saying it's not a real thing. Some people think, well, if the media is really uh, hyping this up, so therefore that don't mean it's not real. But yeah, uh, I believe there are people who do want us to be afraid and, 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 and be uh, fearful and panic and all that. And I don't think as children of God, we ought to do that because our God's still in control. We still serve a God that's on the throne and the Lord was not surprised by this. The Lord has not been taken aback and said, oh, what am I going to do now? The Lord is not at all surprised by this. We need to start learning. If there's anything good can come out of this, it's we ought to learn to trust God and take care of us. Okay. So that's, that's one verse I want to give. And again, if anybody wants to stop me and say something or uh, add something to it, that's fine. But I don't want to get controversial. This is online. Uh, I don't want to stir nothing up. But um, I just want to say, you know, we can have some participation this morning. Look at Psalms chapter uh, 56. Let's look at this one. I'm just going to give you some verses what the Bible says about fear this morning. Psalm 56. In fact, I don't know if I've ever in my life preached a message just about fear. I mean, I've alluded to some of these scriptures, but I can't think of a time I've ever done a message on this. So a good time to start, I guess. Psalm chapter 56, and look at verse number three and four. The Bible says, what time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Amen. Now, let me ask you a question. Are we going to worry this virus away? Nope. You say, preacher, I'm scared to death. Is that going to stop it? Have you ever solved one problem by worrying about it? No. Okay. So the Bible says here, what time I'm afraid. You know what this is? This is a real good time to trust God. Amen. This is a real good time to get close to the Lord. This is a real good time to get your life and your heart with Him where it needs to be. You say, well, preacher, this worries me a little bit. You know what? It's an excellent time to get into the Word. You know, 
Let me just, um, one of the things that came up in the men's prayer meeting last night, uh, uh, Brother Mike, I believe it was, brought up about sports. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I like sports, and it is a bit depressing to know that I don't have any at all to watch. Don't have baseball season getting ready to start. The one that really got me was the ACC tournament. My wife will tell you every year I get excited ACC tournament time. In fact, me and my boys were going to the tournament Friday, and it didn't work out because um, there wasn't a tournament Friday. Now, Brother Mike got up here and took a shot at Duke fans, which I'm not one. Um, so I'm going to say two things about that. Uh, I'm also not, as y'all know, a Carolina fan. Uh, I'm, I'm an NC State fan. So I was told this week by Sister Linda here, well, we can remain friends. Now, at least you're not a Duke fan. Didn't know our friendship was based on, but I, I'm just, I know, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, Brother Mike got up here and uh, was talking about... Um, I guess, I guess he's a UNC fan, I'm assuming. Okay, I'm, but I'll be praying about that. Yeah, well, I mean, the Lord can do anything, but uh, I, I wouldn't push it much further than that. But anyway, um, I went to bed Wednesday night. I had just watched UNC get blown out by Syracuse, and I went to bed with a smile on my face. And I, I mean, I slept good. My dreams were pleasant all night because I knew UNC season had ended. And I was honest, I just went to bed happy. I didn't realize the next day everybody else's season was ending. Now, you're talking about taking the fun out of something. Wow, the Carolina season ended one day before everybody else's. That just, you talk about zapping my joy. That did it. And then I, I found out later in the day, they said that Duke was the first team on Thursday to say we're not going to play their games. And that's obvious. They're going to have to play NC State. I, w I wouldn't want to play it either. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So I thought about that. I said, yeah, I, did, I would figure Duke had to play us. Oh, well, we're not going to play, you know. Much of wimps. But anyway, um, I'm just kidding there, but I just want to interject a little humor into this. But I don't know, folks, we've never seen a time like this. But here's what I was thinking about. Don't have baseball season, at least for now. My son was going to a hockey game Thursday night. Well, Thursday's when they said no, no, no more hockey. So he didn't get to go to that. We're going to survive, folks. We'll be all right without sports. And you say, but what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we can do. Since we don't have the sports right now to occupy our time, maybe just let's throw this out there, see what happens. This might be a good time to read the Bible more and pray more. Think about it. All those other things that was going to occupy hours of your time this week, you could spend that time getting close to the Lord. And if you do that and get close to God, then you know what? The Lord can take this bad thing and make something good come out of it. If, if, listen, anything that makes you seek God with an urgency can be a good thing. Amen. Now, you think about that, all right? Anybody got anything on that? Anybody want to criticize me for my sports comments or anything like that? Anybody at all? Um, <laughs> uh, hey, I stand where I stand. Look, I can't help it. I was five years old, the first time I ever watched a basketball game, and I've loved State ever since, and I will no matter how bad they are, and I can't stand light blue and... Uh, and it's just how it is. That's how it's always going to be. Um, in fact, I went, I was in Walmart the other night and I went and took a picture. I shouldn't have done this probably. I went and took a picture of the Carolina shirts hanging on the rack and I said, if anybody's still looking for toilet paper, Walmart here has a little bit left. You know, uh, so I probably shouldn't have done that, but um, it, it was just meant as a joke. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. The Bible tells us here what time we're afraid. We can trust in him. Look at verse four. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. Let me tell you something. All through the Bible, we see a theme that we are not supposed to fear what man can do to us. Now, not only do we not fear what man can do to us, our trust is not in man. Can I, can I hammer on that just a minute? There are people that today, they believe science has all the answers. Uh, we're going to trust in scientific knowledge and medical knowledge. Let me tell you something. I'm all for advancements. Okay, the Bible said one of the signs of the end times, the last days, is that knowledge shall be increased. There's a reason that's in there. People will go to and fro. You got people traveling all over the world right now. Okay, people will go to and fro. That's Dan I believe it's Daniel 12:4. Don't quote me. I believe I think that's the reference. Daniel 12:4. Uh, and knowledge shall be increased. It shouldn't surprise us when we see an explosion of knowledge. That don't mean we trust man. That means that the Lord's getting ready to come back. Now, let me just say something on that. Knowledge in the wrong hands can be deadly. So you say, well, we're just going to trust science. They're going to create a shot that's going to, okay, I hope they do. I really do. I hope they do. I'm not, 
I'm not telling you whether to take a flu shot or whatever vaccine they come up with. I'm not telling you to do it or not to do it. I, I don't know. Listen, I don't know why people are messaging me. Well, what's your take on this? I'm the last person you want to ask medical advice from. You'll end up dead if you ask me for medical advice and follow what I tell you. Bible questions, you can ask me that. You do not want my medical take on stuff because all I got is an opinion. I don't know, okay? But here's what I'm going to say. If you're going to trust science and you're going to trust wicked, sinful, fallen man who have a lot of knowledge, let me just inform you that the same science that can come up with a shot for this thing is also the same science that can manufacture it in a laboratory. Okay, and you all, you start here. Here's what scares me: you start hearing all this stuff about oh, the world's too overpopulated. Well, you let knowledge get in the wrong hands, and they think the world's overpopulated. Guess what? They might selectively try to thin it out a little bit. Now, I'm you know you say well, that's conspiracy. No, that's just common sense. People are wicked. Don't assume everybody that's smart has your best interest at heart. Okay, and I'm not trying to stir up anything. What I'm saying is I don't trust man, I trust God. The Bible says in Psalm 118, it's better to put to trust the Lord than to put confidence in man. Okay, so I'm going to tell you right there, verse 4 says, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. There's a, there's a cross reference to that over in Luke chapter 12. You don't have to turn over there. I'll just tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said to fear not man which can kill the body and hath no more that he can do, but to fear God who after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. The worst thing a man can do to you is kill this physical body. And men can do that. It's the worst thing they can do. But after that, that's all they can do. You say, well, that's enough, ain't it? No, not if you're saved. They can't, they can't take away what we have with the Lord. They can't take away your home in heaven. They can't take away your eternity with the Lord that we're going to live forever. This life is a speck compared to eternity, folks. And the Bible says we're not to fear them. If they if they come in here with a gun, and, and look, we're going to stop it, believe me. But I'm going to tell you right now, we are not to fear. We're to fear God. We are to get a, a healthy and a holy fear of a righteous God that holds our next breath in his hands. That's the one we ought to fear this morning. The Bible says after God's killed you, there's something else he can do. He can put you in hell if you're not saved, if you reject him. If I were you, I'd quit worrying about man and start fearing God. I'll tell you what's wrong in our churches right now. We don't fear God. If we feared God, a lot of us would not live the lives we live. We would not say the things we say. We would not go to the places we go. We would not tell the jokes that we tell. We would not live the lives we live and engage in the acts we engage in if we had a fear of God. And that's what we need to get back to, folks, a fear of God. Am I, am I out of the book this morning? In God, I will praise his word. You know what? I'll tell you something else you can do right now during this time when you don't have sports to watch and, and places to go. Here's what you can do. Worship. Worship the Lord. Listen, that's one of the best things you can do. I believe men coming together last night and praying, I believe that's one of the most powerful ways to combat this thing. Why should we sit around for six months or a year waiting them to make a shot when we can pray and ask the God of heaven to do something about it? Now, Something Brother Danny brought up last night, this is true. And he'll, he'll probably say more about this, so I won't say much about it. You read through the Bible, you see the word pestilence over and over and over. And that's what a pestilence is. It's a plague or a virus, something that, that could wipe out. When you read about that in the Bible, it was generally a judgment of God on sin. Now, I'm not, not going to say whether that's what this is. I don't, but here's what I am going to say. It's a good time to get rid of sin in your life. It's a good time to get right. It's a good time to clean it up. Listen, if, if something like this don't give you a fear of God, what's it going to take? What's he going to what's he gonna have to let come into your life to make you fear him and understand? And here's the problem. Watered down preaching. Amen. Here's the problem now. You've got people today saying, well, God wouldn't do something like that. You, they better read a Bible. God has done stuff like that, and God can and God will if God chooses to. Listen, you don't, you don't tell God what he can't and won't do. Here's the problem. We don't view sin as bad anymore. We just, we think, we, 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 we've reinvented God to make him a God that's just okay with our sin. As long as you acknowledge him and as long as you'll come to church and, and have a worship experience, he, he doesn't care how you go out and live. And I'm going to tell you, that's what's wrong with this country right now. That's what's wrong with this world is that we have forgotten that we serve a holy God, a righteous God, and a, and a God that hates our sin and a God that, yes, judges sin. And I'm telling you something, if, if that's not your God, you don't have, you're not reading about the God of the Bible. You've got a God of your own invention. People say, well, the Lord wouldn't do... Over and over, you read through the Old Testament, Israel, I will send pestilence upon... You know, uh, how do you miss it that many times? Anybody, anybody got anything on that? Am I, am I off my rocker this morning? No, that, listen, I hadn't studied on this. I just started studying on this last night when I got home. I left prayer meeting a little early. I stayed for a while, but left a little early, went home and studied. So I thought, I want to get some stuff together on this. Um, 
All right, but here's what I would do if I was you. In God, I will praise his word. I'd spend some time in the word. I'd spend some time praising him. I believe you ought to lift up your hands. In the You don't have to do it at church. I mean, you can, but you can do it in the privacy of your own home. Just get along with the Lord. Just say, Lord, I worship you for who you are. I, you've been good to me. I, I laid back there on my seat praying here last night, and uh, I just stretched out across the seat. It's, I found that it's a lot more comfortable than laying on the floor. And not, not that comfort's the main thing, but when you're hurting, it's harder to concentrate. So I've been, you know, and I remember praying. I was just sitting there thinking. I, uh, I think the third round we prayed, it was just to thank the Lord. And I, I started thinking about all the good God's been to me. I can remember, uh, what day was it this week? Thursday, maybe Friday. I had one of the worst days I've had in a long time. I mean, it was just like everything. Everything went wrong. I'd been over to pick something up off the floor and raise up and bump my head on something. It was just one of them days where nothing went right. I didn't think about that. It was, we, no, it was Thursday because I was at work. I didn't work Friday. It had to be. Yeah, I started saying, well, there is something to that. But, you know, um, I believe it was Thursday. But I was having a terrible day. But I, I And I was kind of mad. And I, I was like, what? You know, where are you? I was just like, I'm getting tired. I remember saying one time, I said, I'm getting sick of this. It's was like, and then I thought, well, if I was dead, I wouldn't have to deal with it. But I'd rather not be dead. So I'll, I'll deal with it. You know, you got to try to correct your own thinking sometimes. But I remember just laying there last night saying, Lord, you know, I, I'm a gripper, I'm a complainer, and I am. I really am. That's, that's a weakness of mine. I said, Lord, you've been good to me. I started thinking over the years how, how he protected my little boy. Our, our oldest son almost died at birth, and, and the Lord answered prayer. And uh, all the times he's protected my family. Uh, when I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in 1997, how the Lord brought me out of that. And I started thinking, Lord, i got nothing to complain about, nothing to gripe. God's been good. God has been good. There's some things that you can just sit, look at in your life that God's at, and you can praise the Lord for how good he's been to you. And I say, spend some time doing that right now. It ain't going to hurt nothing. I guarantee you it'll help too. I, I haven't arrived at that point yet. I haven't gotten to the point where I'm thanking God for buffing my head. Uh, I can thank him after I do it, but as far as saying, Lord, I thank you for this knot, I ain't, I'm not there. But um, let me get this pen back on here. But folks, I'm going to tell you something. They say, well, this is bad. Well, we can do some good during it, can't we? We can, we can, we can work on our own walk with the Lord. We can get closer to him. We can do what we should have been doing all along, spending time in the Word. Listen, they ain't none of you now got an excuse to not read your Bible through this year. And you got an excuse. Um, there, you never did have one. You got less of one now. Amen. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what many shall do. There you go. And later after Sunday school, we'll talk about what Lord Christ says about the testimony. We'll do that. We're going to get together on that trivia thing. This guy thinks he's going to take me to Andy Griffith trivia, and it just ain't going to happen. But uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, I think we're both pretty strong fans of it. But yeah, um, that verse goes right along with what we're talking about. Um, Next verse I want to give you. So, well, preacher, these verses you're reading, they're in the Old Testament. They apply to Israel. Okay, let's go to the New Testament then. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. See, that's a problem. Uh, we're dispensationalists, and that's that's good. I, I don't believe you can properly understand the Bible if you're not one. Um, uh, you, let me tell you something. If you're not a dispensationalist, you will get messed up on end times and eschatology really, really bad. Yeah. You won't distinguish between Israel and the church, and you'll have the church going through the tribulation and think that God's replaced Israel, and you'll get into all kinds of other nonsense. Uh, but that, I'm not going to get off on that this morning. But here's the thing we got to watch too. We can't just ignore the old and say, well, God won't do that for us. God can do anything for us that he did for Israel if he so chooses to. I'll be honest with you. I look at 2 Chronicles, not Corinthians, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We quote it. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. In fact, let's look at that verse. I don't, I don't want to just quote it. I want to read the one before it too. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Now, a lot of times we might say, well, that was given to Israel. Well, that's true. Contextually, that is true. Let me ask you a question. If God's people today would do what's in that verse, why wouldn't God help us? 
Okay, I believe he would. So I think we need to look at promises and you say, yeah, we're dispensationalists, but God still wants his people to pray and repent and seek him. All right. Uh, look at verse 13, the one before it. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. Pestilence is what we got going on right now. All right. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What would be wrong with us doing that? Amen. Why, why would we do anything else? Let me tell you something. It would be a stiff-necked Christian that would continue to live in sin knowing that something life-threatening could, could be at their house or in their body tomorrow. That would take a really stiff-necked per person. Here's what I'm going to advise you to do. Do what that verse says. All right. You say, well, I ain't sick yet. Well, if I were you, I wouldn't play with the Lord. I'd fear the Lord, okay? Um, if I was you, if I had any sin in my life, I was living a lifestyle I knew the Lord wasn't approving of, if I wasn't doing something I know I'm supposed to be doing that the Lord's told me to do, if I was sinning in any way, I believe I'd say, Lord, search my heart, show me what it is, and I'll lay it down today and I'll serve you. Yes. That's, that's good advice any day of the week. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Um, it's what our nation needs. One thing I'm going to say, uh, I appreciate our president. I, look, I don't agree with everything our president's ever done. I don't agree with everything he's said since he's been in office, but I want to tell you something I, he did I really appreciate. He, he set today aside as a national day of prayer, and he has asked the children of God to call on God. He says only God can, uh, can help us. That's, that's good leadership, yeah. that right there. I'd rather have that than the president says, look, I got the answers, just trust me. No, I, I like when it says, uh, let's pray. I, I like a president that realizes this is bigger than I am and only God can help. Now, if you've got a problem with that, you got problems. Okay, I don't, I don't care what you think. Of the, if you've got a problem with that, you got problems. Okay, um, so I just want to say that I um, believe we ought to do what the president has said, and I believe we ought to pray today. Let's spend some time praying. All right, let's, get, let's go to the New Testament. I want to cover some verses here. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Again, I know contextually... Uh, some would say the millennium, uh, but again, there's some good, really good. I, I, I don't avoid any of the Bible because of dispensational beliefs. Uh, I believe there's good principles that can be applied. So we're going to do that this morning, uh, Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to notice verse, um, let's see, where do I go to start here? 20, let's start with 27 and read through the end of the chapter. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Let me ask you a question. If a guy looks in the mirror and says, you know what, I'm really short, is that going to make him grow? Are you going to get taller? But are you are you going to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I'm really overweight? Are you just going to by saying that just zzzz. no? You know what you got to do? Exercise and eat right. That's what you got to do. Take better care of yourself. Just by taking thought, worrying, you're not going to change anything. Verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not array arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? I want to talk, talk about this and clear up any misconception here. What shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewith all shall we be clothed? Now, I don't think verse 31 is saying, you know, just sit around and do nothing and expect to be fed. I don't believe that's saying don't go to work. Okay. Here's what it's saying. If times, you know, you're trying to do what you're, the Bible actually teaches you're supposed to work, by the way. The Bible teaches you're to provide. The Bible says if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. Okay. That's why I've been hitting on it hard. I've been getting, you know, anybody don't provide for their wife and child and walks out of their family is not a man. That's, that, the Bible says you're worse than an infidel. Let's just, let's use Bible language. You're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. Don't tell me you love the Lord if you don't provide for your family. Okay. Because the Bible says you've denied the faith. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, that being said, some of this, what might happen, might be out of our control, the impact this is going to have on the economy. Now, look, I'm not talking so much about worrying about getting sick now. I'm talking about some of y'all may be concerned about your job or, you know, what, what are we going to do, you know, for supplies and food and stuff like that. When the Bible says here in verse 31, what, take no thought, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Do you think the people that are going and buying 20 packages of toilet paper are thinking about that verse? Now, listen, I'm not saying if you catch something on sale, don't buy extra and stock up. I do that. If you're smart, you do that. I'm talking about 
a state of panic. I'm going to, I read a story yesterday, I just smiled. As I, this serves this guy right. He went around the state of Kentucky and Tennessee to all the stores buying up every bottle of hand sanitizer he could find. He bought, over, I think, 17,700 bottles of hand sanitizer. And then trying to sell them for, it said, between $8 and $70 a bottle on Amazon. I guess depending on the size of the bottle. And eBay. Well, Amazon, eBay shut him down. So now he's got, I got 17,000 bottles of hand sanitizer and nowhere to sell. Well, serves you right. Serves you right. Look, if, I, there's a difference between good business and just being a sorry, no account individual. If you want to buy it for a dollar and sell it for two, okay. I, I wouldn't say something, but when you want to price gouge, I, I'm glad you're sitting on that stuff. Okay, that's, that's how I feel about it. Uh, I'm not against a man making an honest dollar, but good night, folks. That's, that's, what, that's what greed, that's what sinful, fallen human nature does. Okay, uh, and that's a little of a side note there. But here's what I do think, folks. I believe if we're right with God, we're doing everything we can do and things get out of our control, we got a right to trust God to take care of us. I don't believe God's going to let us starve. I think most of us are a long way from starving. But I don't think the Lord's going to let us starve. I don't think the Lord's going to let us do without. You may not, oh, you may not have all the extra luxuries you're used to, but I just don't believe the Lord's going to forget about his children. I believe we can depend on the Lord to take care of us. Verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Can I tell you something? The Lord knows what you need before you figure out you need it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's a key. Seek God first. Instead of getting in a panic and saying, oh no, what are we going to do? We're going to seek God. That's what we're going to do. If we do that, everything's going to be all right. And his righteousness and all those, these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take therefore no thought for the morrow. Oh, I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. Look, you've got enough to worry about today. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil there. That's what it said. You've got enough, you got enough to worry about today to keep you busy. I think all through the scripture we're seeing a constant theme here. Trust God and get right with God. You say, you're trying to make light. No, I'm not. I can't do anything about it except do what the Bible says. You know, I think y'all take precautions. I don't want this to come off. This is nothing personal against anybody. I'm going to go ahead and say this so I don't have to say it to anybody individually. Me and my wife talked about this. We're not shaking hands right now. This ain't personal. It, you don't say, well, he don't like me. No, I love you, but I'm going to love you from a distance for a while. And you, know, you say, well, he doesn't like me. That's beside the point. No, I'm kidding. I do like But right now, until... Uh, somebody said, well, it's airborne. Well, that's the way I'm going to have to get it then. Because I'm not, I, listen, if, if I have it, I don't want to give it to you. If you got it, I don't want it. I'll, I'll pray for you. You pray for me. Is that fair enough? Until this thing's over. Uh, that's not snubbing anybody, but that's just, uh, I'm not a big fan of that anyway. But certainly during right now, when they're saying not, to, I'm just, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be cautious. I'm not going to try to expose myself unnecessarily to it. But at the same time, God's on the throne. Right. Amen. And that's, again, please, that's not anything against anybody. That's, that's everybody. And I would, I, if you didn't want to shake my hand, I would understand. I wouldn't. Well, I'll tell you. Who does he think? He thinks. No. Folks, it's common sense. Amen. All right. Um, anybody got anything you want to say before I read the next verse? Anybody? Everybody pretty satisfied? All right. I'm with you there. All right. Um, John chapter 14, verse 27. I'm reading all these verses. I'm going to make a point here in a minute um, about fear and trusting in the Lord. And we're going to continue that theme. But I'm going to, let me read you this first. I'm going to make a point. John 14, look at verse number um, 27. This is what Jesus said. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth give I unto you. Can I, let me stop right there and just park for a minute. I think what most of us are hoping for is that we turn on the news and say, this thing's over with. It's done. Go back to your life. That's what we're hoping. I'd like to hear that. But wouldn't that kind of be like getting the peace from the world? I don't want the peace the world gives. I want the peace of knowing the Lord's taking care of me. That's, that's better than any news I can get about this thing. That's better than turning on the TV and say, okay, it's over with. It was overblown. Go back. To, you know, uh, I'm glad I've got the peace of knowing that my God's on the throne and, and I can go to him with anything. That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, um, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, understand the context here. Jesus was getting ready to ascend back to heaven. 
And he's comforting his disciples. If you read the whole chapter, you'll see this thing. He's comforting his disciples because he had just told them, I'm going to be leaving. They're like, what? You can't do that. You, well, we've given up three and a half years of our lives. We have followed you. We've left everything and you're going to leave? That's what. And he says, look, I'm not leaving you comfortless. I will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will comfort you and he will be with you. And what he's assuring them is, I may not be here physically walking with you, but I will always be with you. And we can, we can trust in that same promise now is that, no, he's not physically here with us, but he has sent us his comforter that indwells us. Folks, we don't have to be afraid of anything this world throws at us. We have a God that's able. And that's the message there. All right? Now, here's the point I want to make. We've got about four more scriptures we're going to look at along these same lines. All through the Bible, we're told, fear not. Did you know that fear not is the most repeated command in the Bible. Now, I did read something and I researched it. I had read that there's 365 fear knots in the Bible, one for every day. I don't think that number is accurate, to be honest with you. However, it is the most repeated command in the Bible, fear not. Now, think about that. For yes. Yeah, if you look at different forms of it, it may be, it may amount to that. But I'm just saying, just the phrase, somebody has said the phrase fear not. I had read that in an article. And then somebody said, no, that's not true. But yeah, if you look at all the verses that be not afraid, you know, it, it may. I, I don't know. I didn't count those. But um, the Lord says it over and over, fear not. And we're reading some of those. But you know what? I'm yet to find the verse that says the Lord's lost control with the situation. I haven't found the verse that says you better be afraid because God don't even ha have an answer. Listen, I've not read that. It's nowhere in the Bible. You'll not find it. That says the Lord's lost control with the situation. I haven't found the verse that says, you better be afraid because God don't even ha have an answer. Listen, I've not read that. It's nowhere in the Bible. You'll not find it. The Bible says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, what you're facing right now, what this nation's facing, nor things to come. What happened tomorrow? Listen, listen to this. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, these are some wonderful promises if we'll just take them to heart and believe them. Amen. Philippians chapter 4. Let's, let's look over at that one. I've got a few more to get in uh, right quick. Philippians chapter 4. Bible says, be careful for nothing, but in everything. You know what it means, be careful for nothing? That's not meaning be careful like we would tell our child when they're going, now be careful, you know. It means don't worry, don't fret about it. Okay, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Have you ever experienced a peace that you can't even explain? A time when, according to the world, you shouldn't have peace. How do you, how do you have, I've seen people lose a loved one and somehow have peace. Not yeah, not that they're happy, but they have a peace. They have a peace of knowing that I've got a promise. They, they knew the Lord. They were saved. I'm going to see them again. And I'm going to tell you something. There's a peace that passes all understanding. This world cannot give it to you, but God can. What I would do is I would do what this verse says. Don't, don't worry about anything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Listen, don't leave thanksgiving out of your prayer life. I, I'm going to tell you how I start every prayer I ever pray. This is the truth. Every prayer I ever pray. Lord, I thank you Amen. because of that verse. Okay. Now, another reason I do that is because the model prayer that I don't know why people call it the Lord's prayer. The Lord didn't pray this. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he gave them a model prayer. And he, and he said, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The first thing he told them to do was hallow the name of God. That's, that's praise. That's, that's thank, thanksgiving. Lord, we worship you. Your, your name is, is holy and, and we worship you. That's, I believe that's how y'all start off your prayer. So just give me, give me, give me, give me, God, please do. And I think it's okay to ask God for things. But I'll tell you something. Don't just presume that God is there as, as your genie in a lamp that you can rub and he'll grant you three wishes. God is somebody to be praised and worshiped. Amen. And um, the Bible says, let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And then that peace of God through any trial, through any storm, through any tribulation will keep us through whatever it is. I believe that, folks. Um, 2 Timothy 1.7. I got two more here. 2 Timothy 1.7. There's a lot more. I could not give you all of them this morning, but I'll notice this one. The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You say, Preacher, I'm, I'm fearful this morning. It didn't come from the Lord. 
Fear of God is the only fear I see in Scripture you're supposed to have. Fear of God, but uh, he's not giving us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, a sound mind. You, listen, sound mind. Just use common sense, folks. Think about things the way God sees them. I think if there's anything missing in today's world, it's people's sound minds in the church. People's, people's thinking is weird on stuff. Can I just tell you something? I still believe this book. I don't believe it's outdated. I believe it's more up to date than any book they're going to ever write. Uh, oh, the Bible's really out of date. How, is, how are things that are happening right now in our world prophesied in it thousands of years ago? You, you explain that to me if it's out of date. If this is just another book written by men who didn't know where the sun went at night, a bunch of nuts that says that. I, I laugh every time I hear that one. They don't even know where the sun went at night. I told my wife the other day, it would take about two days of watching the sun rise over here and go down over here to figure out that's what it does. And I'll tell you something, you, you know, just process it. You know, they must think people were like caveman ignorant back then or something. If I had just been created and lived two days, I would notice the sun comes up over here and goes over here. I would conclude one of two things really quick. Either we're moving or it is. Duh. Okay. And I would get up the third day thinking, you know what? I'll bet you that sun's going to come up over there. I'm not going to argue geocentrism versus uh, heliocentrism. That's not the point. If, if I didn't know anything about that, then I would say e either we're moving and it's stationary or it's moving and we're stationary, but something is moving and that's why this keeps happening. That would take literally two days. And these idiots, it says, well, the people that wrote the Bible, they didn't even know where the sun went. You've you got to be incredibly dumb to even say something like that. Amen. Honestly, anybody would say something like that. Don't lecture me about being dumb. Okay, you need to figure out what happened you know, with, your, with your brain because it ain't about that big and you ain't got any sense to even say something like that. It wouldn't take two days to figure that out, would it? Is there anybody in here who could not figure that out if you saw it twice? Okay. Anyway. Yes, sir. I believe them people that think that the Christians are going to go through the tribulation have not lived by not being in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's. I mean, it's, that's a whole different topic, but I think there's like a hundred good reasons to say why the church. When I, I think I maybe know what you're referring to a conversation on Facebook with a brother who is, does not believe that we're going to be raptured, and I'm going to hit that a little bit more. Me and him were discussing a little bit. I mean, good brother in the Lord, but man, doctors messed up on that. I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, that, that'd be a good topic we could uh, go over sometime because I believe the brother I'm talking about is what they call an amillennialist. I haven't, he won't tell me. I asked him, I said, which position do you hold to? And he didn't answer me. Uh, I believe he believes there's not going to be a literal millennium. And I'm thinking, well, the Bible just says they rule and reign for a thousand years. I mean, I don't know how, if the Bible is wanting to make it any plainer, I don't know how it would do it. Um, let me tell you something, folks. I do believe the church is going to get out of here. That don't mean we're not going to suffer before we do, but we're not going to go through the seven year period called the tribulation. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, mysteriously, after the address to the seven churches in Revelation, after chapter 3, you don't ever see another mention of the church during the tribulation until the tribulation is over. Well, where, well, how, how odd would that be? During the whole entire tribulation, the church isn't mentioned one time. We ain't here. Common sense, okay? All right, well, anyway, we're out of time. Uh, I would like to take some comments. We didn't have time this morning, so let's bow our heads. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that, you're, all that you've done. Lord, we know you're in control. And God, if there's anything, Lord, if you could use this thing to get your people serious with you, Lord, and bring repentance to this nation, then God, let it be, Lord God. Let people turn to you and let people realize that there's a God in heaven, Lord. We've offended you. We've, we've sinned against you. We've rebelled. We've gone our own way. We've done our own thing. And, and Lord, then when we have an emergency, all, we all of a sudden want to call on you. That's what we should do. But Lord, we're not going to take you for granted. Lord, we know you're a holy God and a righteous God. And Lord, I'm just asking you today to turn this, turn the hearts of your people back to you this morning. God, if there's any wicked way in us, let today be the day we walk away from it and renounce it and repent of it, Lord. And God, I just pray you'll 
Lord, help us this morning. I pray you'll be with us as a church. Lord, if there's one today that doesn't know you, what a good day to get saved. Lord, what a good day to come to know you in the free pardon of sin. Lord, we pray that that would happen, Lord, and we thank you for it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can't even speak about it. He knows the depression you go through and the anxiety attacks that you face in today's society because you got a daddy strung out, you got a mama that's half the time gone, and you're living in a part time home, and you think nobody understands, you think nobody knows, you think nobody cares about the disease of your heart, you think nobody can come down and feel the feelings of your infirmities, you feel like nobody will ever know about the deep scars that somebody put on you. You say, Brother CT, I was molested. I was hurt. Could I say God knows? And you may not understand and it may hurt you. You say, why is it I come to church and other kids got their mama and their daddy and I can't even find my mama. I can't even find my daddy. Does God love me? May I take a break, clear me off the spot and say God does love you. Jesus died for you. He cares for you. He loves you with the love that the world reproduce. Bless his holy name. There's church folk in here been hurt. And you're you got a wall blocking the blessing of God. And you don't you, you think, boy, God ain't never gonna mess with me. I've done made such a mess, everything. God don't even know where I'm at anymore. You're depressed out of your mind. You're fighting hell by the acre. The devil's telling you you are nothing and a nobody. But could I say it ain't over till God says it's over? In this place. And I want us all to stand up. Look at the person beside of you. Tell them, say, you're prettier than the person I sat beside first service. The dearest friend I ever had, Miss Terry, finding words in the back. The dearest friend I've ever had, Jared, come lead this. The dearest friend, I've had a lot of friends in this world that have let me down. But how many of you know Jesus is the dearest friend you've ever found? Bless his holy name. Let's sing this old song, the dearest friend I ever had. When I was free. 
sing it one time, but I like 346, Jesse. Let's do that. Can y'all do that one again? Is that all right? How many of you know your names in the book of life tonight? This is my favorite song. Let's sing. My name is in the book of life. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. Come on. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's all stand and grab a hymn book this morning. So glad you're here with us. Let's turn to number 177. Amen. Number 177. Are you washed in the blood? Number 177. Help us sing out now, good and loud, as we worship this morning. Real loud on the first now. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully 
trusting in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb sing now are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb amen on the second now are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you on the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Sing out now. Are you washed? That's good. In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. On the third nail, sing it out. When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Pure and white in the blood of the Lamb. Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright and be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Sing it now. Are you washed in the blood? Glad I'm washed this morning. Amen. Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? On the last, lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sing, church. Are you washed? Amen. In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed? Sing that chorus again. One more time. One more time. Sing it out. Are you washed? Amen. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? All God's people said. Amen. Amen. Well, that's what's good singing this morning. What a blessing. If you're washed the blood of the Lamb, let's hear a big amen. amen. Hallelujah. Boy, I love that song. Uh, that means a lot to us right now, being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Somebody sent me a verse the other day, that verse over there in uh, 1 Peter, one that says, uh, James, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. That's a good verse, ain't it? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Hallelujah. I'll preach on that. Uh, I will in a little bit, uh, but it's a blessing to see everybody here this morning. I knew y'all would show up for church. I know you a bunch of uh, rednecks, uh, people come to church, but I'm glad that you're here this morning. We want to pray this morning. Uh, seriously, we're going to do things different today. I'm going to make some announcements. Um, we'll have just a really short few seconds time of greeting each other, and then we're going to uh, make some announcements and stuff and get right into the message. Um, I've told y'all for years and years, how many times you heard me stand up here and say, enjoy the day, take advantage of it, worship God, because we might not always have this opportunity. And so, um, uh, how many times have I told you, uh, come to church while you can, while you're able, serve God. The day may come uh, when you can't. And of course, uh, we're not there yet, but that, that day will come eventually. I hope we're gone when it does. Um, I've also told you just a few weeks ago, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Our country was riding high uh, for all these last few months, and you got to be careful about that. Now, um, I, I, I'll say this right quick. We will have a meeting tonight with some of our men and our bus captains, all bus captains tonight, as for plans for next Sunday. You know, our governor has put an order in place that you're not supposed to have over 100 people gathered in one room, and it was, it was, it was too late for us to change it for today. 
Uh, it, there's possible that we may have to have different, two, two different services next week or maybe even three, uh, but we'll make that decision tonight. We, we want to respect our governor and obey the law and um, cooperate all we can. The only time we have a right to disobey the law is when it crosses God's law. And if and when that happens, then, of course, you know, we'll do what God says. But for now, for next week, we will uh, probably uh, have two services, one at 10, one at 11, or something like that. But you'll, we'll stay in touch with everybody and check. I don't know how y'all y'all check. No, get in touch with me. Somebody can let you know what the schedule is for next week, and we'll meet with our bus workers tonight. As of this morning, or as of last night, there are no confirmed cases of the coronavirus in Western North Carolina. None as of last night. That may change while I'm speaking. Everything I'm saying as of Sunday morning, March 15th. Some of y'all won't see this for a few days. No telling what you'll have by then. So um, don't forget that. Um, I never thought that they would tell me I'm too old to come to church. I'm offended by that. Uh, I mean, I, I th I've heard a lot of things, but I thought... I'm too old to come to church. Now, wait a minute here. I think us old people should rise up and protest. Don't you? Amen. We're being discriminated against. If we want to go, we should be allowed. But seriously, uh, I never thought I'd hear that. You're too old to come to church. Um, we will announce tonight what our plans are. You want to be sure and be here tonight. Six o'clock, come praying. And um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll mention all of that, okay? Okay. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have just a short time of elbow bumping. Uh, very, very short. Uh, you know, that can live in the air for three, three, three hours. So that ain't going to, you know, that ain't going to protect you. Bumping elbows. But you, we'll tell you how to get protection in a little bit. But we'll, we'll have just a short time of fellowship. And then our ushers are going to come. We're going to receive our offering. And then we'll just go from there. Okay? All right. Let's all stand. Turn around and bump.
Mr. November? She quit. She knows. All right, let's just remain standing for offering this morning. Amen. Everybody remain standing for offering. I'm good. All right. All right, let me tell you something more filthy than kissing everybody in here. That's touching that right there. It is. More germs. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. But hug. Okay. That's the filthiest thing in here this morning. Filthy lucre, what the Bible calls it. So uh, after you touch that, when you better wash up. I'm just, I'm just kidding about the kissing. I'm totally kidding. Let's make a point. Let's all give this morning, honor the Lord. He'll bless you for it. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Uh, during these times, we want to honor him, put him first. Um, everything is still on as far as we know. Youth rally, April 17, 18, 19. Uh, we'll make adjustments if we have to. If we don't, we're going right straight on with it. And uh, we're looking forward to a great time in the Lord. Um, the bill's got to be paid regardless. And so let's everybody give and do what's right, and he'll bless you for it, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all ready for a good Sunday school class, for the good singing, for the good time of fellowship, just getting to see everybody. Pray now that you'd bless this offering this morning. Let it be what you want it to be, Lord. Multiply it, use it for your glory, and we'll thank you for what you do. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody settle down now. We're going to go ahead and get right into the message, and then uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit before we leave here today. Um, I announced Wednesday night before all this happened. From Wednesday night on, the world changed since Wednesday night. Well, what I was going to preach on this morning, we already had the prayer meeting scheduled for last night weeks ago. Now, looking back, we see the Lord was in it, and I thank Him for His goodness and kindness, leadership, glad the Holy Spirit of God never leave you, never forsake you, and um, I hope He's especially real to you during these trying times. We've been so used to having it so good in this country so long, we don't know what hard times are, um, but we'll probably find out before it's over with you. But this morning, I'm going to speak to you from my heart, and I'm going to start in Psalm 106, 106. The simple, like they say, the short answer to all this is in these two verses in Psalm 106, and um, very simple, too simple for the world to grasp, but it sums up the whole problem in two verses. Psalm 106. Verse number 29. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment and so the plague was stayed. As the cause of the plague, verse 29, the cure for the plague, verse 30. What causes plagues, men's sins, what cures them is getting right with God. That's, that's the short answer. Long answer is the same. It just involves a lot more detail. I want to preach this morning on the subject, the coronavirus, a step toward the mark of the beast. As of last night, um, just in America, Almost close to getting the 3,000 people infected, 60 dead, 74, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in, in, the, in, the, in the world, estimate 155 
thousand dead, or I'm sorry, cases, and six thousand dead worldwide. Now, to introduce this message this morning. I am not a medical doctor, nor I'm going to try not going to try to be. I am a Bible believing preacher. That's what I've always been, and I try to stay out of their field and expect them to stay out of mine, except where the biblical principles and prophecies or morals have been questioned or violated, we leave it up to them. I listen to, I respect, and I try to follow the advice of a doctor, my doctor. I listen to him. He tells me stuff when I, when I go see him once in a while, and he said, you should do this, 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 this. I respect him. He knows a lot more. That's his expertise, and I respect him in his field. Now, Corona is an interesting word. The word means crown, and that's because that virus looks like it's got little little thing crown uh, sticking up. And there are several actual Corona viruses, but this is one they they designated COVID nineteen. It started in twenty nineteen in December, whenever it was. Came from bats, they say. Not sure about that. And almost all plagues in history come from animals jump from to human and fleas most of the time uh, from uh, bats, horses, camels, and rats, especially when, when sailors would come from other countries or war, they bring home ships with rats, with diseases, and they would wind up infecting humans. And I'm going to talk a lot more about that tonight in tonight's message. Uh, you don't, you don't want to miss. Um, as I said, as of right now, this morning, March 15th, it may be two weeks before a lot of people watch this, uh, there are no confirmed, as of last night, cases in Western North Carolina. And I'm expecting that probably to change. Thank God for his protection upon us so far, and no doubt that will change. So the Lord's been very merciful and good to us. We've had many viruses before, the SARS, Ebola, um, all, all of these things. A virus is an infective agent that can copy itself, reproduce itself, make it more and more and more. Exa like them CDs back there, just make copies of the, of the original over and over and over, and they're just the same as the original, but it has to have a living being to do that, uh, to live inside of it. There's three words I'd like to uh, define as I begin this morning. Um, one of them is outbreak, one of them is epidemic, and the other is pandemic. Many of you may not know the difference between those three until this week. An outbreak is just that, something that breaks out in a small, unusual, defined period of time in a certain place in a certain population, mostly confined to a certain geographical area. An epidemic is when something spreads to a larger geographical area and maybe into a country. You've heard that word epidemiologist that they talk about all week. Uh, that somebody who studies that kind of stuff. A pandemic is when it goes international, many countries, and out of control. Uh, for example, this morning, Italy, the whole country of Italy and Spain is just about on lockdown. They say... Uh, but on the news, I, I never turn the TV on on Sunday morning unless there's an emergency. But I thought, I better check, see what the latest is. And I just had it on for like five minutes. And it was showing uh, Spain where people are literally, literally shut up in their houses. Uh, uh, just about the whole country. And uh, that's, that's what's going on. Gatherings. We all saw the cancellation of the, the NBA, uh, the Major League Baseball, the NCAA uh, basketball tournaments. And now on down to schools uh, here in North Carolina and in several other states. Now, as we begin to think about this this morning, listen to me carefully. As usual, as always, there are nuts and, and um, uh, fanatical, radical nuts on both sides of any issue. On one side, there's the people saying, oh my goodness, this is in the world, we're all going to die. Uh, and, and they're wrong. It's not the end of the world. Uh, we know that from the Bible. On the other side, there are people say, oh, this ain't no big deal. It's a bunch of junk. They're wrong too. It is a big deal. 
So as always, we, 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 we stay with what the Bible said. I heard one preacher say uh, on the internet, I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing how long they're going to say this. Uh, you end up saying, bless God. They didn't say, bless God. They don't talk like that. They'd say, uh, we accept no virus. We accept it. Just tell it no. And we'll see about that in a couple of weeks. I, I, hope, they, I hope they're right, uh, but, but we'll see. One, one preacher's wife was on his program saying, we just not accept, tell them, tell it no, tell it no. I don't think you can hear you. Uh, but uh, anyway, we take the same level-headed biblical approach just like we do on everybody else. i tell you one thing, we've seen just how quick everything can change just like that. Life as we knew it up to Wednesday, it ain't the same no more, and it ain't going to be for a while. We see just how quick everything. We're living in a day when everything's connected to everything. Years ago, when a when an epidemic broke out, it was in a country, and, and a lot of times it was other places, and it, we didn't even know about it uh, before the communication like it is now. Now everything's connected to everything. When one thing goes down, everything goes down. And we've become so dependent upon the, the, the rest of the world, the government, our, the, the media, our, our food chains, everything that when it, co when it crashes, everything crashes. And so we're going to think about that this, this morning. And I'm going to say, uh, what, what does the C COVID-19 have to do with the Bible and the mark of the beast? When I announced this sermon Wednesday night, uh, a lot of people thought, oh, Brother Danny, you're always trying to make everything. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just going to show you, if you'll listen to me, how this is connected to a step toward the mark of the beast. This is not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast ain't a disease. It's a mark. But this is a step toward preparing the world for a one world government, a one world monetary system, and a one world religion. This is definitely a step toward that uh, day. And that day will come, no doubt about it. Now, three things I want to say about this, and then three as far as my advice for you as a Christian and for those listening wherever around the world this morning. Number one, number one, I believe that the, the, the devil will use a situation like this and a thing like this uh, for three things. Number one is a way to stop church. The devil hates the church. The devil, the second power to God, hates church. He'll do anything in his power to stop church. Uh, he'll do it. And this is the satanic forces will use this opportunity as a, quote, trial run just to see how far they can go in stopping church. Now, uh, there's, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says we have to meet in a church building. Matter of fact, matter of fact, in the Bible, there is no public worship service. In the Bible, there's public preaching service and evangelistic service. And that's what this is. You've never heard me call this a house of worship. Uh, the, the Bible don't call it. It's not a house of worship. We don't even meet here to worship. We worship God all week long. We meet here to preach and pray and get the, the God. We do worship God while we're here. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the primary purpose of this place. This, this is a fire department. As I the other day. This is search and rescue work that you and I are in. And the devil hates that. He hates it. And he just uh, wants to see how far he, he can go with this. See, uh, we, we, the Bible said we, we, we not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, we don't have to come into a building like this. Uh, it, they, they met in, in houses in the New Testament. And it may come to that point where we have to do that again. If, uh, if that time comes, it may not come in our lifetime. But when, when circumstances change and the time comes when they literally forbid you to have an open public place like this to worship God, then we meet in homes. If they ever say you are not allowed to worship God at home, then we got big problems. 
Then we have uh, a right to break, uh, to break the law because we are supposed to worship God and honor Him. If it comes to homes, they, 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 if you try to stop from that, you've got to do it anyway. Now, we, we may not be able to do this. They may padlock the door for before the Lord comes back. This may be the step of a many that's coming in two years, in five years, in ten years, everyone a little more intense, everyone a little bit worse, everyone a little bit as we step toward a one world government. Don't doubt it for a second, people. The devil hates this church and every church trying to do anything for God. The devil hates anybody who gives out tracts, who puts out the gospel, who supports missionaries, who runs buses. The devil hates it. And 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 not only the devil hates it, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of uh, uh, political leaders and there's a lot of, of uh, uh, just atheists and pe just people in general who hate the work of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a way to stop church. Number two, uh, what, it, what it's going to show us is it's a way to stifle the country. The way to stifle the country. Our economy is going to hit, be hit extremely hard by this. And let me tell you something, brother. We're going to fill it. We're going to fill it financially. It's going to be it's going to be really completely thrown upside down, probably. Um, and and because of that, the devil will use that to stifle the country. Now, when something like this takes place, uh, it makes you think of several things. One thing I was thinking the other day, I thought, uh, you know, there's a lot of atheists. Them old atheists used to get out and they'd shake their fist up at God and they'd say, I dare you. If there's a God, strike me with lightning. Ah, you ain't got no power. And everybody would go, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And, and they'd say, my goodness, God's going to strike him with lightning. And the Lord never did. He's not going to waste power on people like that, that dumb. Uh, he, never, he never did do stuff like that. And I got to thinking, there's, there's a lot of people say, where's God? Well, he, they witnessed to a boy one time over in Asheville. And he said, you know what? He said, you keep telling me that I'll stand before God. I ain't scared. He said, when I stand before God, I'll go up there and choke him right on his throne. And that's the attitude that a lot of people have. They think God, they brought God down. Cartoons have made Jesus look like a sissy and the devil look like a muscle builder. And the world's portrayed uh, Jesus as some kind of effeminate, sissified uh, weakling. And the world thinks uh, Christians are all hypocrites. And work. Let me tell you something, brother. If God wants to bring this world down, he don't, he don't have to have a lightning bolt hit uh, the continents and split up the continents to kill people. The Lord don't have to have a 50 on the rector scale um, earthquake to bust up the planet, brother, he can take something so little we can't even see it with a microscope and wipe us out if he wants to. We better fear God. We better fear God. Your life is in his hands. He's got your life in his hands this morning. I'm telling you today, it is a way to stifle our country. Everybody uses something like this. I'm using it this morning. I use this to witness. I use, we went out on bus route yesterday. We knocked on doors. The, the kids are so excited about coming to church today. You wouldn't believe it. They, uh, they are so excited. And I, I said, hallelujah. Oh, we're going to have church and we're going to enjoy the Lord and bless the Lord and enjoy God. And, and I use this. I use this. I use this to be a witness uh, for the glory of God. Now, everybody else uses it too. The, the, um, the, the companies, uh, anybody that needs a job, go get, find you a toilet paper factory, brother. Start you one. You can get rich. But this weekend, uh, I still ain't figured out what that's got to do with the coronavirus. Don't tell me. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 you find hand sanitizer. You can invent it. All you got to do, uh, some old redneck lady in the dollar store somewhere tells me all you got to do is get you some of that um, aloe, aloe, big old aloe, rub, pour the rubbing alcohol in it, shake it up, hand sanitizer. That's all it is. And you can make your own, get rich, but tomorrow, take the flea market and, 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 and sell it. Uh, our economy is definitely suffering and going to suffer. Now, the political parties use it too, just like I'm using it to preach and be a witness. Uh, the Republicans used to say, well, well, see, boy, we've got, we're going to, we're handling this right. We're going to do all that. More power to you. I hope you are. Do the best you can. President declared a day of prayer today. I'm thankful for that. He's going to church here preaching this morning. Thankful for that. Maybe God will get a hold of his heart. Maybe God will get a hold of their heart. Maybe we can see a revival. Great. Wonderful. The Democrats are using it also. Uh, they're trying to say, hey, you ain't no good. We're going to overthrow you. And they got more to win in this than, than the other side does. And, I'm, and if you think I'm being political, you are listening to demonic spirits. 
You hear me? If you think I'm being political, you're listening to the wicked spirits. I'm not. I ain't, I ain't got no politics in mind. But I'm saying there are people in this world that would like to see our economy crash to overthrow the powers that be. They would. They're, they're hoping for it. Matter of fact, there's even been some insinuation of how this started in China. I ain't making them because I don't know. I know one thing. The devil uses it. The government uses it. The Democrats use it. The Republican uses it. Everybody uses it. Lazy preachers use it who don't want to study anyway and say, whoo, we have to call off church and I still get my salary and my pension. Uh, but I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we are seeing the way to stifle our country. America still supports more missionaries than any place in the world. America still puts out more gospel than any place in the world. And we see it moving toward that day when we hope, hope the devil would try to stop us from doing it. Let me just say this about this business of the law. I will, we will obey the law. We will obey the law. Even though something inside me says, we will obey what the law says. Well, we will not have a gathering of more than 100 at a time and, and do what the law says. We are not advocating breaking the law. You're supposed to respect and honor those that are above you. So we'll do that. If we have to do it, we'll have to do it. But they said the exceptions of those laws are restaurants, hospitals, absolutely, fire and rescue, police stations, stuff like that. Did you know the church is a restaurant? You know you come here to eat? You know, feeding your soul is just as important as feeding your body. You're a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Did you know this morning that the church is a rescue mission? We are a mission. This ain't no place where we all get in here and swoon in a house of worship. Brother, we're on a mission. We have a divine command from God to preach the gospel to every creature. And all that. so uh, we should be exempt. But we ain't. Uh, what about separating the church and state? Where'd that go all of a sudden? Uh, uh, listen, I know what we can do. We'll all meet at Walmart next week. That's legal. 500 of us next week at Walmart in the parking lot, and y'all will sing and I'll preach. Amen. Golden Corral. Amen. In the parking lot. You see, that the devil is using this to try to stop church. We'll cooperate best we can. But I'm telling you, by the grace of God, we'll stand for the Lord and Him first. I said, number one, it's a way to stop church. Number two, it's a way to stifle the country. Number three, it's a way to seize the currency. Now, for this, I want you to take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter number 13. You say, Brother Danny, what has that got to do with it? I said a minute ago that your money is the most filthy thing you can touch. The Bible said in 1 Timothy 3, 3, it calls it filthy lucre. You don't know where it's been. You don't know where it's been. The money you got changed yesterday at the dollar store, at a toilet paper factory, don't know, you don't know where that money was a few days ago. The coronavirus, the experts say, can live on that piece of wood right there for three days. It can also live in the air for three hours. So you're going to go to the store? You're not going to go to the store? You're not going to go, you're not going to, go uh, to the post office? You're not going to go to the grocery store? Yes, you're going to go. You're going to go. And if somebody coughed it and it's in the air, it can live three hours in the air. Now, let's talk about money for a little bit. Revelation 13. This is during the tribulation period. The Antichrist rises in verse 1. The beast out of the sea. You see that? The sea is multitudes of peoples and nations. It tells you what it represents. A beast in the book of Revelation is a king or a kingdom. So the, king, the kingdom rises up out of the nations and this one Man, who will be the Antichrist, the opposite of Christ, Jesus foretold of this man when he said, I'm coming in my Father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. The Bible foretells him in 2 Thessalonians 2, where it said, the man of sin 
will arise. The son of perdition. There's only one man in the Bible called the son of perdition. That's Judas Iscariot. And the Bible said when Judas died, it don't even say he went to hell. It said he went to his own place. Nobody, it's not said that about anybody else in history. The spirit of Judas Iscariot will ascend out of the pit and inhabit the body of the Antichrist. You know, like Jesus' baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him there at his baptism. The spirit of, the, of, the, of Judas will come into the body of the Antichrist and he's called the son of perdition. Now look what he does. Look at Revelation 13, verse number 13. 13, 13. Like yesterday. And he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Now hold your finger there just a second. There's going to be a time his, his wound will live. That's why that one eye stuff. That's why you see all them movie stars and everything cover up one eye. All that stuff. It's a pit. The, the Antichrist has a bad right eye in the book of Zechariah chapter 11. And he's, he's, he's got his bad right eye. That's why this one eye. That's why you see this one eye. I mean, we, we've talked and talked about that. I'm sure I'll talk about it more. So the, the Antichrist will impose this law. He has a deadly wound, but he gets better or resurrected possibly. And the Antichrist will have power to do miracles in the sight of people. Now, let's just imagine for a second. I'm not saying this is exactly what's going to happen. I don't know. I'm just imagining for a minute. Jesus said in Matthew 24, in the last days, which will be now right on up till he comes, maybe some uh, during the tribulation, I'm sure, there would be pestilences. You know what a pestilence is? That's a disease. And all that there's no cure for. Pestilence. There will be pestilence. Now let's just suppose, let's just suppose, you heard that, that, this thing dies down in a few weeks or months and then it comes around back next year. We deal with it for a few years. Then there's another one. Then there's another one. Then there's another one. Jesus said they would come. Suppose that millions and hundreds of millions of people were infected by some disease. That time will come. I'm not saying this is it at all. I'm saying this is a step toward that. Are you, are you with me? Say Amen. All right, now if the Lord come, and I mean, if, uh, before the Lord comes, or after he comes, hopefully we'll be gone by then, and he, he, when this thing happens, let's just suppose that millions and millions of people have a, have a disease that can't be healed. And all of a sudden, the quote, government, which he'll be in charge of at that time, comes out with a cure, an inoculation. But the only way you can get this inoculation is receive that mark. You don't think people will be bowing down at their feet and worshiping? You better believe they will. Now, there will be a one world religion, there will be a one world dictator, and there's going to be a one world monetary system. Watch this. Look at verse number 15. And he had power. I'm reading you the Bible. You claim to believe it all these years. Now listen. And he had power to give life under the image of the beast. That's some strange stuff there. That the image of the beast, that's that Iron Man, that's Iron Man, uh, part man, part computer, part demon, uh, should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in, not on, in their right hand or in their forehead. Some kind of chip, some kind of device, I don't know. In. And verse 17 said that no man might buy or sell. You can't buy nothing. You can't sell nothing. You can't buy groceries. You can't pay your bills. You can't go to the doctor. You can't go get gas for your car. You can't get your car inspected. You can't get attacked. Nothing. Unless you have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Are we headed that way? 
The only way that can happen is get rid of cash. That's the only way that can happen. As long as people got out here money handing around, you can't stop people from buying and selling. So the plan is, the plan is, is to eventually eliminate cash, cashless society. You've heard it preached 25, 30 years. Right now, they just had an article on uh, TV the other day called Dirty Money. The spread of the coronavirus is forcing institutions around the world to rethink a very, very germy surface cash. In South Korea, Central Bank is taking all banknotes, cash, out of circulation for two weeks and burning some of it. China is, is treating a lot of its cash with ultraviolet heat to try to desanitize it and laundering some of it and destroying some of it. The Louvre Museum there in Paris has completely banned cash altogether, cards only. For the mark to be implemented, you have to decrease and then finally eliminate cash. That way you can control all financial transactions, all by electronic payments, all are, 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 can all be monitored, and you can't monitor cash. Now this sounds like a good idea. If I didn't believe the Bible, and I didn't know what the Bible said, I would think, yeah, that's great. I would. And most of the world will think that. Matter of fact, we're moving there really, really, really fast. Most Chinese today pay by scanning or on with their phone or that little phone you got that can pay your bills. In the UK, cards are online. Cash is no longer accepted on public transportation and the ATM machines are disappearing. Sweden is the number one leading country leading this movement. 85% of the, the, the banking in Sweden is done online and only 2% of purchases in Sweden are made by cash. Now, Sweden, something right in Denmark, and over there, all that stuff starts in Sweden and then it jumps the pond from the UK, comes to California, and then works its way back to us. That's the way it's always been. Fads, sins, clothing styles, all that stuff starts over there, and everybody thinks, wow, they're so cool. That's where this, uh, this uh, free health care for everybody, uh, that's how that, they say these other countries are doing it, these other countries are doing it, and they'll use this as an opportunity, as another step toward that. Here we are, because the government's going to pay everybody who's out of work, the government's going to pay for your uh, tests, and I'm, I'm not against that I don't reckon I don't understand a lot of that, uh, but I'm, 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 what I'm saying is we're moving toward a cashless society. What do you think would happen if when it gets a thousand times worse than what it is now? If you eliminate cash, here's the way you sell it. First, you'll lower crime. You don't have to worry about somebody stealing your purse. You don't have to worry about somebody getting your credit card. It, it's all right here. A lady, look how convenient that is. A lady can take her kids, go out to the park, go to the beach, pay for everything, just scan your hand, pay for everything. You don't have to worry about getting robbed. Think of all the crime that would be lowered. Backdoor drug deals, where cash are. No, stop that. The government would have a monitor on all financial transactions, 100% if there's no cash. So if that's true, then there's less money laundering, none. Less time and cost of printing money and counting it. Look at how easy it'd be for international travel. Instead of getting exchanged from dollars to pesos or wherever, wherever you're going to uh, uh, German money or Chinese money, you just it automatically switches your money to their money and their money to your money. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're headed. The mark of the beast may include or give you right to an inoculation or a vaccine that would cure a terrible disease that will be going on during the tribulation. May. 
me. And I said, me. Wouldn't doubt it one bit. He's got power. Then when God pours out his wrath, we'll talk about that tonight. When God pours out his wrath, there's going to be a sore developed on the people that have the mark of the beast. And God will do like he did in Egypt back in the Old Testament when all those plagues came on Egypt, but his people were spared. Things is fixing to heat up. And we may not see it in the next year, next five years, next ten years, but everything I'm saying to you this morning, except where I say this is my opinion, will come to pass. Finally, I'll say three things. Let me give you some advice. Personally, I want to ask, ask you and, and advise you three, three things. Don't panic. Don't go crazy. Don't, don't quit doing what you need to do for God. You'll not get it if you do that. Things are going to get worse. You've heard, my, you've heard my philosophy for years. Expect the worst. Hope for the best. Take what comes. Thank, you, thank God for you ain't in hell and keep your mouth shut. Right? Hope for the best. Expect the worst. Take what comes. Keep your mouth shut. Thank God you ain't burning in hell. What a blessing. Three things I'll tell you what you want to do this morning. Number one, wash your hands. Wash your hands. I'm, I'm the world's worst. I never wash my hands. I, I eat stuff off the floor. I, I was playing ball. Really, I never thought about stuff like that. Dirt's good for you. Germs ain't, but dirt ain't going to hurt you. I was playing ball the other morning, and this stuff got in my head. Don't touch nobody. Don't shut. I was out there with 12 of us there, and everybody was sweating. And the ball, everybody touches the ball. And I found, my, just like I always, every time I went down the floor, I went like this. I wiped sweat. I wiped, I wiped sweat. I wiped, I wiped like that. And I thought, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then we had one of them little things like that back there. And, and I take it and squirt. And I thought, Lord, that's probably the germiest thing in here. That little thing on top of that hand sanitizer. And I started, I started getting weird, feeling weird. Don't get like that. Don't get like that. God took care of us all these years. He's able to take care of us now. Chill out, right? I think. Calm down. Live for the Lord. Do right. Uh, and, and wash your hands. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Amen. It can live three days on that right there. Cleanse your hands. Wash your hands. Number two, wash your heart. Wash your heart. You better make sure your heart's clean. If anybody gets sick, James 5 is still in the book. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of his church. Let them pray over him in the name of the Lord, and the Lord shall raise him up. So that's our, that's our weapon against sickness. Wash your heart. The Lord could use this to get our hearts right. The Lord did say to Israel, if you'll serve me and do right, I'll keep these diseases away from you. That's not to us. That's a promise to Israel. The Lord never promised a Christian they'd never get sick. Them TV preachers are crazy. They'll get something before it's over with. But there is a principle there. There is definitely a principle taught there that if you serve God and do right, your chances are way better of, of staying right. Wash your heart. Wash your heart. Wouldn't this be a good time for everybody to wash your heart? Wouldn't this be a good time for everybody to say, wash me in the blood of Jesus, Lord, I quit doing it. I quit that. Quit your cussing. Quit your drinking. Quit smoking pot. Quit living for the devil. Quit watching dirty movies. Quit looking at trash on your phone. Wash your heart. Amen. Good time to do it. You can't go home and watch football this evening. Wash your heart, brother. You watch an old rerun. Watch Netflix. Watch your whole time doing that. Why would you want to waste your time doing that? Why would you want to waste your time watching stupid movies when you could be saying, man, what an exciting time to be alive. I'm going to wet my heart right and I'm going to witness to people and I'm going to get everybody I can say, what? hey, don't, listen, you young people don't dare do something stupid like go to spring break. Don't do it. That's wicked. That's wrong. You ain't got no business going to a bunch of mess like that. I don't, I don't care if you like it or not. Anybody with a brain in their head knows that. Stay away from bars. Stay away from honky tonks. Wash your heart. Wash your habits, number three. Wash your hands. Wash your heart. Wash your habits. It's a good time to stop playing church. Spiritually, there's a lot of diseases. I 
thought, you know, them canceling them Broadway shows and stuff up in New York. I said, good. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Wash your habits. I'm going to stop right there this morning. I'm going to reiterate a couple of things I said, and then we're going to have Miss Desi come, and we're going to pray. Wouldn't it be a good time for you this morning to wash your heart? Wouldn't it be a good time to get saved? You say, Brother Danny, is all that bad stuff you talked about coming? It sure is. It sure is. This is just a step in that direction. Let's pray for our leaders. Pray for the pray for the Democrats. Pray for the Republicans. Pray for everybody. Pray for people in China. Pray for pray for everybody. Let's pray for everybody. Let's respect our leaders. We we respect the governor. We respect his order or whatever it is. That's probably going to be challenged this week by a lot of preachers and stuff. But we'll do what we're supposed to. But your your responsibility is you doing right before God Almighty. And let's do that. Let's stand with our heads bowed. She's coming. And I want to do something this morning I never do on Sunday morning. I have before, but it's been a while. I want us to have an old-fashioned altar prayer. If you don't want to come to the altar, you can pray there at your seat. But everyone that can and will, if you're not hindered in some way, would like to just kneel around here this morning. While she's playing softly, we're going to get down here and we're going to pray. Pray for our country, pray for our kids, pray for our churches, pray for our families, our kids, our grandkids. Lord have mercy, y'all. This is March. There's no telling what could be going on this time next week. There's no telling. There is absolutely no telling. God only knows. Time quit playing church, ain't it, buddy? Ain't it time for you, Daddy? Quit playing church. Ain't it time for you just you hit and miss, pray and quit, read and throw it down, Christians. Quit playing church. Well, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't. There's a wake up call. Wake up call. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never been saved by the grace of God. Why don't you come get saved? Why don't you ask the Lord to save you? Come deep in your heart, deep, deep down in your heart. Do you know everything's right? Do you know everything's right deep, deep down in your heart? I hope that you'll come. I hope that you'll move here this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we ask in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit of God, we thank you, Lord. The door is open. It's shining like Baptist Church. I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you'd bless everybody in this place today. All the kids back yonder, bless them, the bus kids, the junior church, everyone here today. Lord, I know there's people here struggling already financially, physically and spiritually Lord help us help us to rededicate our life to you as brother Wayne said last night give a hundred percent help us to give a hundred percent help us to give one hundred percent do what ought to be done and God will thank you and praise you for it we love you Lord bless those that are sick not able to be out this morning that had to work the traveling gone family and friends Lord, help us this morning. Help us to put you first. We'll stay right with you, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. So I'm still praying. Don't, you don't have to get in a hurry. We're not done. God's... Sing that and mean it this morning. Search me and try me, Master, today. Amen. Better than snow, Lord. Amen. Wash me just now. All right, while these are still praying this morning, uh, 
tonight. Uh, well, I'm gonna, we're going to dig in some prophecy, and I'm going to preach on you ain't seen nothing yet. And I'm going to go over plagues in history, the great, famous plagues in history. I know a lot of people say, well, I want to be uplifted when I come to church. Oh, you might need to be downloaded uh, or something. <laughs> Some, you don't all, sometimes we need to be downloaded a little bit before we need to be uplifted. Uh, so uh, be back this evening, 6 o'clock. Lord bless you for it, okay? All right, turn that thing off a minute. Well, then, well, this ain't the rest of the world's business. Um, all right, they off, they're gone, the world's gone.